Hi, I'm Marlene Graff. Thanks for watching. The title of this session is Syllabus Tweaks, Things to Keep and Things to Delete. You may already know that I teach on the Logan campus at Utah State University. I am in the Nutrition, Dietetics, and Food Sciences Department. I also enjoy cycling and bikepacking and spending time with my family. I'm going to make all the PowerPoints for this presentation available, including the ones that I took out so that this presentation would stay within the allotted time. And so those will include links to all of the resources and examples that I share, and I hope that that will be useful to you later on. Let me just say that I'm not an expert or pro when it comes to syllabi. I've made my share of mistakes in the past, and my syllabi still have room for improvement. However, I have learned things, and I've progressed, and I've made important changes that have been benefited my students. And I just want to share some ideas that have helped me and hopefully they'll, they'll be useful to you also. You may have noticed that there is another session in this conference about your syllabus and why it matters. This is a live session by Dr. Harrison Kleiner, Heidi Kessler, and Janet Anderson. I'm sure it will be excellent, so I hope that you'll be able to attend or listen to the video re recording later on. Um, and then hopefully um, this session and their session will complement each other and you'll gain some new insights from each one that will help you when you create your own syllabi. Okay, so in this session, I just want to share some new ideas, examples, and formats that will make your syllabus more functional for you, but also more warm, welcoming, and user-friendly for your students. So let's start with the purpose of a syllabus. We're going to talk about layout, length, and language. And we'll address things to keep or adopt, and then things to delete or adjust in all three of those areas. We're, we'll also end with some examples and resources. So first, let's talk about the purpose of a syllabus. Most sources agree that a syllabus generally functions in at least three ways. First of all, it's a roadmap and shows where you're going over the course of the semester. And then it's also a contract and it's an indicator to students of what type of experience they can expect in your course. It also often becomes a first impression for what type of instructor you're going to be. And so it's worth investing some time in, and I, and I know that most students do see their syllabus as an important document and um, spend a lot of time on it, and yet many of our students feel overwhelmed or intimidated or confused by traditional syllabi. Many students report that it's too long or that it's boring and it's hard to find information, and I know many instructors, myself included, who often think, well, if students would just read the syllabus, They'd find that answers to their questions or they wouldn't struggle in my course so much. And yet I think one of the things we can do better on as instructors is making our syllabi easier to reference and find information in so that it's easier to navigate and scan and so that students can find what they're looking for uh, to begin with. So let's talk about layout length and language. When it comes to layout, that means the format of your syllabus or the terrain, how it looks. And so I want you to think of yourself as a cyclist. Um, this is a relatively new hobby for me. It's one that I'm really enjoying. But in every race or competition that I've competed in so far, they always provide a map of the course or the route well in advance. And that gives every rider a chance to kind of um, see what's coming up, what to be prepared for, know where the hills are going to be, know what certain mileposts to look for, and your, your syllabus can function in the same way, where it, it's, a, it's a way to communicate to your students what parts are going to be heavy and where it's going to be lighter and where they need to be at specific times. And so adding visual elements really helps communicate that. Things like graphs, charts, pictures. It also makes your syllabus easier to read and find information in. Adding um, subheadings and putting it in outline form makes it more scannable and easier to read and easier to reference. Also, columns, tables, boxes, and lists help all of us, but they're especially useful for students who have dyslexia or other learning disabilities. The font that you use is important. Use a sans serif font, one that's easy to read and simple, and then some white space also improves readability. If you add color, that often helps. Um, that's not always required, but um, a little color goes a long way. This journal article says that students 
uh, usually perceive their instructors to be kinder, more creative, and more approachable if the if the syllabus is has visual elements. And so adding in some graphs, tables, and pictures will help your students, but it will also help you. And it will also improve the relationship between both of you. And so things to take out with layout or things to avoid would be fonts that are hard to read. Uh, Times New Romans is considered a serif font. And so, you know, it's worth considering changing that if you use Times New Roman in your syllabus, change it to something that's simpler to, to read. And then also be careful about too much color or certain types of colors. Some students are colorblind or some students have sensory processing disorders and or, or ADHD. And so overdoing the visual effects or the visual colors like the syllabus has done can um, kind of be distressing. And so this is actually a good syllabus in a lot of ways, but in terms of colors and visual effect, it goes overboard. So let's do length. Think of yourself as a backpacker. When you go backpacking, uh, you want your pack to be as light as possible, especially if you're going on a long trip. And yet you wanna include all of the essential things that you're gonna need. And so in your syllabus, you wanna keep it short and tight and concise but you also want to give students enough information. And so one of the things you can do is change things like the text size or the font style or the margin space, but you can also add things like a table of contents to make it easier to navigate. I love using hyperlinks so that I can reference information in another place and then it doesn't take up space in my syllabus. Uh, videos have also been really useful for me. So my husband and I recently push, purchased a new washer and dryer. <clears throat> and the owner's manual is really long. It's 100 pages. And it's a great owner's manual. It's very detailed. It gives lots of good step-by-step -step instructions. And yet, it felt kind of overwhelming in the beginning. And so what we did instead is we went to YouTube and we looked up short videos about how to get started, um, how to install things, everything else. And then we've used the videos and the owner's manual uh, together since then because they complement each other. And so I, I hope that you'll try out the same type of concept with your syllabus. And rather than just providing an owner's manual, create some videos also. And those videos can either summarize your syllabus or, or sections of your syllabus, kind of like these videos do where they just kind of do a Cliff Notes version of the syllabus and key points, or they can expand on things that your syllabus addresses or refers to. So these videos go into more depth on certain assignments and they provide more instructions or, or more examples, but, and then I don't have to take up space in the syllabus to do that. So once again, with length, uh, take out unnecessary text and white space, we tend to collect more information from year to year instead of cleaning out the clutter. And so um, it's important to go through on occasion and just, uh, you know, determine whether or not a paragraph can be condensed or taken out. Also, take out any words or acronyms that would be unfamiliar to someone outside of your field of study or else explain what they mean. We already talked about using hyperlinks. And so here's an example. Um, this is a website from the USU Provost Office where they, like, they've provided free paragraphs about lots of different policies at USU. And you can go in there as an instructor and copy and paste and add things to your syllabus. And I did that a lot in the past. But now I just add one sentence that says additional USU policies regarding X, Y, and Z can be found here on this page, and then it refers them to that page. And so if at some point they need more information on the grievance process, for example, or or sexual harassment, then they can go to this page and find what they need. But then it doesn't take up extra space in my syllabus. Let's talk about language. This part is really important because um, it's an indicator of, of the tone that, that you're gonna bring to the class. And so um, 
think about being a parent. I have a, a little girl and she's very in tune to, to the tone of my voice and what that means. And she can usually track what my mood is and how she should interact with me and, and all of that stuff. And your students um, are, are in tune to that also. And so when I say think of yourself as a parent, I don't mean a dictator or disciplinarian or someone who dominates. Instead, I mean someone who's a mentor and someone who's invested in growth and development and someone who um, is respectful and encouraging and inviting. And so if you'll use language in your syllabus that uh, is focused on growth and learning and invites students to participate in your course rather than, you know, you know just being a document of rules, then that will go a long way. Make sure that your policies are equitable and flexible and, and fair. By equitable, that means that they can be adjusted to fit different students and different needs and different circumstances. Also, explaining the why behind certain policies and, and the coursework that you're requiring is also important because uh, and it doesn't just seem like a list of work. Um, this article was really left an impression on me. It's one that I hope that you'll take a look at, but the author says this. He says the traditional syllabus is rule infested, punitive, and controlling. The tone of the typical syllabus is more akin to something that might be handed to a prisoner on the first day of incarceration. So I know that seems a bit dramatic, and yet I don't think he's wrong. I think sometimes our syllabi appears too formal and, and too rule-based. And so he goes on to say a detailed legalistic syllabus is diametrically opposed to what makes students want to learn. Controlling environments have been shown to consistently reduce people's interest in whatever they are doing or learning. And so when you construct your policies, and I know that there's a lot that you need to think about and consider, but um, ask yourself, are you, are you um, meeting students where they are? are? Are you showing respect? Are you communicating that you trust them and that you believe in them and that you're on their side? Or are you um, coming across as someone who's diametrically opposed to their uh, learning. So here's examples of policies to rethink and, and some things that you can include or incorporate that might be useful and you know, just offer a little more breathing room for students who are humans instead of robots. And um, anyway, something to think about. Also, be aware of language that may come across as punitive, harsh, derogatory, or demanding, and take that out. If it's not aligned with who you want to be as a teacher or how you want to be um, in relation to your students, then uh, then just take it out. Um, also, be careful about all caps and bold text and underlining because, as this author states, the net effect of those things is that of a teacher yelling at the student. So. I actually do use all caps and bold text on, on in my syllabi, but I only use it for navigation purposes so that it's easy to scan and people can find information quickly. And every paragraph has a descriptor at the beginning that it explains in one or two words what it's going to be about. So here's some examples and resources. Um, Canvas includes a syllabus tool where it imports a template syllabus for you. This was designed by awesome people at USU and it's such a great tool. I hope you know about it. If you go to your course syllabus page, click on the edit button, then you can add the USU syllabus template and it will import all of the USU policies. They're all updated and they update from semester to semester. And then from here, you can go in and fill in the information that's relevant to your course. So I think there are a lot of upsides to having a syllabus template and using it. And yet, I also think that sometimes students might become blind to certain information in syllabi, especially if everyone's looks the same. And so here are some ways to emphasize yours or personalize it um, so that students don't miss information that you want them to know. You can do a visual syllabus or infographic. 
Here's some examples from two courses that I teach. This is the first page of both of them. And a little bit goes a long way. And so adding in tables or graphs or lists really seems to help students digest information more and it makes it easier to understand and reference quickly. So um, consider that. A liquid syllabus is something that's heavily promoted by Michelle Pekansky Brock. Uh, she contends that this style of syllabus, which is just open access on a website, um, is useful because it adds a humanizing element and you can import videos and you can um, interact with your students in it in kind of a more natural way than a traditional syllabus. She also teaches a course about how to create a liquid syllabus and you can click on the link here to gain access. It's a, it's a free resource. You can do an interactive syllabus where you kind of walk through, you walk students through your syllabus piece by piece, or you divide it into chunks or sections, and then they go through and then they respond to different parts of your syllabus by answering questions or, you know, adding feedback or something else. So here are links to two examples. Um, both of them have used Qualtrics, and you could do that also, or you could use Atomic Assessments or the quiz tool in Canvas. There's lots of ways to do an interactive syllabus. A collaborative syllabus is where you invite students to participate in the process of creating a syllabus with you. And this is something that this author recommends and does, and he's had a good experience with it. I tried this a year ago in a 4,000 level course, and it, it totally backfired. And uh, students felt like it was too ambiguous and too loose, uh, didn't have enough structure. They also felt like I was unprepared on the first day of class and lazy. So I don't think that I would do it that way again. Uh, instead, I think what, what might have been more useful was to have them help me construct one or two policies instead of a whole syllabus. So syllabus quiz or activity is something that I highly encourage because it helps students engage with your syllabus from the beginning and kind of teaches them how to navigate and where to find things. And so I generally send out a copy of my syllabus before the first day of class, and that gives students a chance to preview it. And then they come to class and that first week we do some sort of activity. So one example would be a Kahoot quiz. And uh, I just ask questions that, that have you know been addressed in the syllabus. And then we go through it as a group and we talk about it. And then after that, then they're responsible for doing a syllabus quiz on Canvas on their own, and it's open book so that they can refer to the syllabus, and they also get more than one attempt so that their highest score counts. But it's it's a way to invite them to look at the syllabus and find answers to questions. Um, a course schedule, I've already talked about how important a, a roadmap is, and to me, the schedule is a roadmap. There's lots of ways to format it, and yet, um, I think it's important that somewhere in your schedule or on your syllabus, you are adding uh, comments that show, you know, kind of mileposts in your in your course or where students should be or how one unit relates to another unit or um, things like that. Here are some more resources to consider when it comes to tone, language and accessibility. I, I really like some resources by Matthew Cheney. He talks about a cruelty-free syllabi and, you know, has a, has a blog post and also a presentation and slides that he shares. Here is an example from his class on his late work policy. You can see that he's done a really good job of explaining the reason behind the policy and offering an explanation for it. He gives the why. And then he invites and encourages conversation um, using language that's um, inviting and user-friendly instead of just uh, really punitive or rule-based. So another website that I really like is this accessible syllabus one. I'll uh, let you check out that link. The last thing I want to talk about is the SCOTS program. It stands for Student Collaborators on Teaching. This is offered by the Office of Empowering Teaching Excellence, or ATE. If you go to their website, you can find more information here. 
So basically ETE hires undergraduate students and trains them for how to evaluate your syllabus and other components of your course. And so you reach out to them and then they review your syllabus, they offer feedback, they tell you, you know, where you can start, what's going to have an impact because they can see things from a student's perspective. So that's all I have. Uh, once again, I'll provide PowerPoint slides with resources and references. Thanks so much.